Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Doug. This is going to be an episode entitled, Is Covenant Theology, Sproul's Version, an Apostate Teaching of Justification by Faith Alone that Jesus Contradicts? Yes, he contradicts it multiple times. John 8, verses 30 to 47. Mark 9, verses 42 to 47. Specifically, also in Luke 18, 9 to 14, where he specifically ties these issues to justification. And then, of course, Bishop James agrees in James 2, 24. We should all know that, where he says, justification is not by faith alone. The only place where the words faith alone ever appear, and also they happen to appear in relation to justification. And uh, Bishop James was Paul's superior because we, in Acts 21, Paul submitted to him to prove that he was acting rightly. We'll get into that. So anyway, let's uh, take a look at John 8.30. Now, most of us don't know about this, and this is a clear refutation of the faith alone doctrine, and you are never told about it because exactly the no reason it's because it is contrary to faith alone doctrine. Let's look. Uh, John 8, beginning at verse 30. Even as Jesus spoke, many believed in him. Verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. So what does that tell you? He's inviting them to now hold to my teaching. He, they've begun, but now they have to stick with it. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 33, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, verily, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins or keeps on sinning is in the active tense there, is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So how do you become a son? You have to be set free from this life of sin. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me. Now, please listen to the next words of Jesus. Because you have no room for my word. So Jesus is saying people who believed in him, who he wants them to be disciples, who don't have room for his word in their life, they're going to just say that it's not necessary to actually literally follow Jesus' words because I'm just going to accept this atonement offering unconditionally. It's mine. Or whatever doctrines they're going to justify, how they can be saved without actually following Jesus. But he's saying that's a believer who gets to this point where his Jesus' words have no way of penetrating you because you've put a block. You have a uh, I'm going to call it the Pauline filter. You just put a block up and anything Jesus says that, that has any sense of requirement of anything more than just faith alone, you're going to block it. It's just this passage is just going to be blocked. You don't want to listen, but please listen for your salvation's sake. Listen to Jesus. He is telling you right there, don't block his words. Make room for his words right now because he's going to tell you what happens to these people. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence. So when you block Jesus, what who's... Who, what, what kind of words, what quality of words are you rejecting and putting off to, you know, oh, that's the old law. This is, you are rejecting words he got from the Father's presence. That's what he's telling these people. Then he says, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. So now Jesus is a little bit miffed at them. <laughs> then the, the, they say, Abraham is our father. They answered. And then Jesus says this, if you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do, have do what Abraham did. Now this is the NIV. This is a this is a incorrect translation. You know why? It's ergon. It's deeds. It's not a verb clause. Do what Abraham did. It's do the works of Abraham. And you can tell that is necessary to make sense of the passage because Jesus is going to go down here in verse forty one. You are you are doing the works of your own father, and then he's going to they're going to respond to that. They're not happy about what he's trying to lead them up to. So, my friends, this this passage has been massaged to not let you see that. If you've done the works of Abraham, Jesus would recognize you, basically. But these people have done no works. And, and, they're, and he's saying you would have done the works of Abraham right to this point. <laughs> but they haven't done the works of Abraham. So he's disappointed. He's telling them, I'm disappointed. You, you have not even gotten close to your ancestor. And he is different than you. He did works, but you are doing, you don't want to do any. So this whole idea of Ergon is being erased by translation and it's disappeared. It's turned into do what Abraham did. What is that about? Let's go on. Verse 40. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. There it is, Ergon. Ergon a second time. So, so clearly the parallel is lost. The NIV doesn't care about what Jesus is saying. Do you realize, people, there's theological translating going on that you can't hear what Jesus is saying because they mute him? They turn him off? 
We are, and then they respond, we are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. Do you show love for God, for Jesus when you just put his words into a different dispensation or a different covenant or a covenant of works and just, ah, I don't have to deal with him? He thinks you don't love him because you're not wanting to be his disciple. That's how he responds if you let this passage teach you what Jesus wants you to hear from it. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. Literally, the people who are buried in covenant theology do not listen to Jesus anytime he says anything beyond faith alone is necessary for salvation. They'll find a way to excuse it, explain it away, and not listen. Their hearts have become hard, but I'm appealing to you. If that's you, don't do that today. This is your time to listen. This is a great passage of Jesus to unlock your restrictions that you put on, that people have told you you have to believe a certain way instead of following what Jesus clearly is saying here, breaking through all the theologies, all the doctrines, all the traditions. And I let's continue. Now, this is the bad sentence. Would you want to hear this from Jesus if you if you were ever afraid of what would happen to a believer who rejects to become a disciple and who rejects Jesus' words and don't let them penetrate you. This is what you're going to hear on Judgment Day. Verse 44, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Do you want to hear that on Judgment Day? No. And these men walk away. He says, you're, you're sons of the devil. And that's, that's enough to make the point, my friends. That's enough to make the point. Okay, now this passage doesn't actually use the word justification, but it, the only way this works and makes sense is that justification is by doing what Jesus says to do here. In other words, to to uh, be able to go to heaven. So let's listen to what he says here in Mark 9. And whoever causes scandalizo, that means causes someone to sin, causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. Pistoa ASC, just like in John 3.16 and a lot of other places. So whoever causes one of these little ones to sin who believe in me, that's actually how it should read, it would be better for him if a large millstone were hung around his neck and his he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, scandalizo again, see? So the believer is being instructed, it's a continuation of the instruction to the believer in Jesus. Cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than having two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. So you see, cutting off that hand, that's not faith alone. Continuing, and if your foot causes you to sin, in the same word, scandalizo, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life lame than having two feet and to be cast into hell. So what do you got to do? You got to cut off the, the body part and snaring you in sin, the, the, the limb. Now, Jesus is talking metaphorically. Please don't go out and start chopping off parts of your body. It's in your head. You control all these parts. You don't need to cut it off if you just control your mind. But these these imageries Jesus is giving is, is so strong that you will put it on your heart to do and obey what he's telling you. And Jesus is going to say this one more time. This means this is like... I've never seen Jesus do this in any of his message where he repeats the same message in three different ways. That means it's so important. He's stressing it. And if your eye causes you to sin, scandalizo, throw it away, ekbalo. That means toss it out of your brain, out of your head. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God, heaven, having one eye than having two eyes to be cast balo into hell. That nothing could be more clear that the believer has these two options, heaven maimed or hell whole. You don't have an option to say, I believed in you. I want to go to heaven. No, no. He's saying that's not going to work. you got to do something like this. Oh, but this sounds like works, Doug. This is a different law. This is the gospel of works. And that's all gone. That covenant of works is all gone. We've gotten a better message from Paul, right? That's what they want to tell you. And that's what you believe. That's what you thought was true. But that isn't true. You are apostatizing against the words of Jesus. And apostasy against Jesus, I'm going to show you, is a death penalty in God's kingdom, meaning you won't make it. If you keep throwing away Jesus' words, he is the prophet. And Peter says in, in Acts 3, we'll go through it, that if you do not obey the words of Jesus, you will be cut off from God's people. That's Peter telling you what the prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 meant. And that who is who Jesus also is, besides being the Messiah. Many Christians don't know that, so I'm going to... 
explain today, there's a apostasy principle that Jesus also enjoys equal to or maybe even higher than Moses, as we'll get to. Let's continue. Now, justification is discussed here in this parable by Jesus of the Pharisees and the publican. And this is Luke 18, 9 to 14. And let's read this. To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. By, by the way, Paul always makes a big deal about boasting and thinking too highly of yourself. You know, this is a reminder that there's a, another remedy other than adjusting the salvation doctrine to be the cheapest grace you can possibly get, right? Like, why don't you just give person a command? Don't boast. <laughs> don't think too highly of yourself and, and be humble. That's really the antidote. It's not changing your salvation doctrine to adjust to the lowest common denominator of humankind. But anyway, I digress. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Verse 13, but the tax collector stood at the distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. My friends, that's not faith. I mean, he has to have faith to get to this point, but he's, he's gone beyond that. He's now promising and adhering to turning around and repenting from his sins. This is not faith alone. This is something totally different from just believing the death, burial, and resurrection that Paul teaches you can be saved if you just believe in these three facts. That's in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. Verse 14, I tell you that this man, rather than the other one, went home justified. Jesus used that very word, dikayu, before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. A good reminder that the solution is to listen to Jesus. Be humble. Don't be boastful. But don't change the gospel to adjust to that. So that's the whole point of Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. It's like uh, you basically, uh, the, the reason God's going to make it a faith, you're saved by faith, not works is supposedly to keep you from boasting. But just why don't you give us this command of Jesus? Don't boast, to be humble. The, the Pharisee is the boaster and the humble person is, is the person who's going to be saved, but not by faith alone, but by what? By promising to turn around and love God. So let's just read again what the tax collector does. Verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. That's a heart that says he's broken by sin. Now, I know that people say, oh, Paul says uh, 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 godly sorrow leads to repentance. Great. Let's keep all the verses that Paul says that are uh, sheep-like in one category, but remember all the verses that are wolf-like that t t take us away from Jesus and give us a different gospel, which is actually what Mr. R.C. Sproul R.C. Sproul does when my, I'm going to get to that in the end. He's going to take us away from Jesus and actually assign any of these obligations that he's given you here to something called covenant of works. And then you have to have just this covenant of grace, which is really just a repackaging of what Luther said. So I don't really see it's much different. But Luther himself, by the way, repented from faith alone. Do you do any of you know that? <laughs> yes, he repented from faith alone. He actually also repented from believing uh, in Paul. Oh. In fact, I'll give you another thing. Go purchase the antinomian thesis or find it online and read it carefully. He's calling Paul out as an apostate. When he decided he's no longer going to teach faith alone, he's going to go a different route, he says anybody who teaches you to go away from the law is an apostate. And he doesn't even mention Paul ever in the book. I think he has one footnote that says something nice with what Paul said on something. But that was where his conversion away from, from uh, his own apostasy. And he was trying to lead people back to Christ. And the Lutheran Church eventually did change its doctrine to double justification, which is you're saved initially by faith, but you must have a secondary justification by works. That's called double justification. Erasmus taught it. Tyndale taught it. And Luther caught on, and he became the third major person who, who agreed with it. And Melanchthon, uh, and then he died, and then Melanchthon carried it forward. And the Lutheran Church changed in 1555 to no longer be faith alone, but to be double justification. This lasted till 1580. So see, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm telling you has already been done and went through. But you know what? The sola fides took it back in 1580 and changed it back to the way it was when Luther started, not when he finished. But let's continue. Okay, and then the last of the four things I wanted to show you is going to be James 2, 24. Now, this isn't Jesus speaking, but this is someone who is superior to Paul. Now, how do I know that? Because Paul acknowledged he was his superior when Paul is told by James in Acts 21, verse 21, that the 
apostles, the elders have heard that you're uh, guilty of apostasia, that's apostasy against Moses, teaching that uh, the Jewish people don't have to do circumcision anymore, keep keep uh, the law, basically. That's what apostasy from Moses means. And and then he told uh, Paul, he said, you're going to do something. And I'm going to go through this later. I'll show you the verses. But he basically says, you have to do something. And Paul obeys, never says, I... I, for all the years prior, he's been teaching as a tutor and all this stuff. Obviously, the apostles have no idea what he's teaching because if they had ever seen Galatians, they would, this wouldn't even have been a discussion that was a rumor. <laughs> but anyway, we'll, we'll continue on. But anyway, this is so clear. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And he even attacks Paul's reliance on uh, the Genesis account. And just so you know, where it says in uh, the Greek, both of uh, Matt, uh, James and in uh, Paul's writing in uh, Romans 4, verses 3 to 4, there's an ambiguity in the Greek, which says, and Abraham be believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. The word it, according to Paul, is referring to the, the belief, but according to James, is referring to the gift of promise of someone in old age. And so it was counted as a gift, uh, uh, excuse me, a righteous act of God towards him. If you read it in the KJV, it's following the original Hebrew, which it's very clear the subject of counted is not God, it's Abraham. Abraham believed God and he, small h-e, even the KJV, meaning they know it's Abraham because there was no he, there's no uh, a masculine article there. So Abraham believed God and counted to him God as righteousness. See, Abraham's doing the counting, not God, as Paul misunderstood the verse or misinterpreted it. So... That's what James clarified, if you're paying attention. And you have to know these mis mistakes that Paul made to understand what, Luke is, what James is even doing. But I digress. Now, if I can show you that the teachings of R.C. Sproul, Sproul of covenant theology with this covenant of works versus covenant of uh, grace, if I can prove to you it's contradictory to the words of Jesus that I just uh, showed you, would that be apostasy in the legal sense under Deuteronomy uh, 13. And I believe it is, and you'll see why. So the question here is, it's a sub-question, is apostasy from the words of Jesus, the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, as, a, as, as condemnable as apostasy against Moses? So you have to actually know the apostasy in 13.1 is says apostasy against Yahweh, not Moses, but later became known as apostasy against Moses. But I'm going to say that apostasy against Yahweh is just as severe with where Jesus says, the when I speak, the words you hear, the logos you hear are not mine. They belong to the Father. So if you contradict Jesus and his words are coming right from the Father, you are apostatizing against Yahweh. So, but I'm going to just say it this way. Is this as condemnable as the apostasy against Moses? And I'm going to show you. Peter clearly says so in Acts 3, 3 21 to 23. And most Christians have no idea about this passage. You'll see why. Okay, now I'm going to read... Uh, all of this again this is from mount so as things go streaming by if you uh want you can see the greek underneath the words verse 19 repent therefore and turn again for the blotting out of your sins so i'm going to pause there this is the gospel message of peter in acts 2 acts 3 excuse me and therefore he's following the same teachings of jesus it's not by faith alone it's by repenting that there may come times of refreshing from the presence of the lord and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things, which God spoke of by the mouth of his holy prophets. And that, by the way, is dealing with uh, both uh, Daniel 7 and Daniel 9, talking about the Messiah, and the Messiah has to, uh, will come uh, at a certain time. And so Jesus is now up in heaven. He cannot come back until that final time. That's why he, it's called the sign of the Son of Man. So Chapter 7 of Daniel, it's, it's the Son of Man who approaches God, and this is what his commission is. He's going to come to earth, and he's going to take over the kingdoms of the world. And in verse chapter 9, it's the Messiah, and he is going to do an atonement, and that's another topic. Um, let's continue. Verse 22, Moses said that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet from among your brothers as he raised me. You must obey him. Obey him obey him in all things whatsoever he speaks to you is there any now this is a quote of moses by the way so what what peter is understanding is just as you had to obey moses you have to obey this person jesus so 
and and actually God says in the original, it says, I'm going to raise a man like you, Moses. And and then it, he goes into these statements. God, Yahweh does that to Moses. So this is a, ver these are quotes from the passage. You must obey him in all things which ever he speak to you. And it will be that every soul who does not obey that prophet will be what? Destroyed from among the people. In other words, just like in Moses' words, if anyone taught contrary to the words that Moses had received from Yahweh, that person would be executed. That's in Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 10 in the final verse. Uh, I think it's actually in verse 9 of that passage. And that means here the same thing is you will be cut off spiritually from God's people if you apostatize against Jesus. If you take Jesus' words and you put them to a covenant of works and you forget about him and you think you can close his his words off from your heart, you don't have to keep Mark 9, 42 to 47 in your heart. You're literally, literally committing apostasy against Yahweh because you're apostatizing against Jesus who has the logos of Yahweh. That's what the severity of this risk is. And that's what I, this is the thing you should deduce from this passage. All right, now, so based on Peter's remarks in Acts 3, 21 to 23, I believe that when Baker Bookhouse wrote this, uh, well, Mr. Geisler wrote this uh, Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics, I would change something here. He has this. If the preaching of the apostle, Paul, did not accord with, he, he mentions Paul in this context. If the preaching of the apostle did not accord with the teaching of the Old Testament canon, it could not be of God. So I've already demonstrated, he clearly teaches uh, the law was a tutor and it's gone. And yet 20 times it says uh, it's everlasting for all generations or eternal for all generations. So Paul is a clear apostate under the Old Testament law. But I'm showing you he's apostate under uh, the, Jesus because Jesus is now like this, in the same role of Moses. He's a conduit of God, Yahweh's word. And that's why you can't contradict him without being an apostate. So I would change this for all encyclopedias. Just let's re remember Jesus is the prophet. Everybody has forgotten that. All right. It seems to me. And so this is the this is the uh, fuller context, and this is how I would change it. We listen to the far, fuller context, Baker Encyclopedia. Any teaching about God contrary to what the people already knew to be true was to be rejected. If the teaching of the Apostle Paul did not accord with the teaching of the Old Testament or Jesus, that's the change I would make. It could not be of God, Norman Geisler. That makes sense, doesn't it? Now that you've seen that Paul, Peter says, if you don't obey Jesus, you're cut off from God's people. That's yes, that means apostasy. It's a, it's a penalty that only apostates can suffer just for disobeying somebody. All right, and uh, now just let me tell you something, but not everybody who quotes Jesus is somebody you would follow. Like Joseph Smith claims he's quoting Jesus all the time. He says he met Jesus and Yahweh, in fact, in his backyard in Palmyra, New York. Do we have to obey him? No. Now, why is that? I'm going to go quickly over this. Uh, Jesus, in the sign of Son of Man prophecy, says that if uh, the first thing after uh, he he departs, he sends, he says, the first thing you're going to have to deal with is there's going to be people who come and say they met me in a private room, private place, private wilderness, and they're going to say, I, I'm Jesus, and they're going to claim they're the Messiah. Do not listen to them. And he says, when I return, it will be a universal return that's unmistakable. It'll be seen from every point, east and west. So did Joseph Smith have a, a vision of Jesus or, a, or, excuse me, an appearance? He says he literally appeared on his backyard lawn. Did he have an appearance of Jesus that was seen from every point, east and west on earth? No. So this is a person you don't have to listen to, right? There's another person. This, this exact pattern happened. Paul. The words of Paul of Darius are attributed to Jesus do not qualify to be words of Jesus because he similarly... Jesus ascends in Acts 1. This appearance event in, is in uh, Acts 9. Paul calls it an appearance emphatically in 1 Corinthians 15 from 5 all the way to 8. He's saying, hey, I was, you know, Mary Magdalene saw Jesus and then the apostles saw Jesus and then I saw Jesus. I was last born out of time. So he does not qualify. But if you assumed he did qualify, let me just show you something. The only words he ever quotes of Jesus are horrific words. <laughs> so in all his epistles, he never quotes Jesus giving him a teaching. He does quote the communion liturgy. He might be quoting from the works worthy of his wage, even though he doesn't say it's from Jesus. But this is the only actual quote in all of his epistles from Jesus. And it's it's over here. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is fulfilled in weakness. Now listen to the context and tell me if you want your you want to remember Jesus this way. Okay, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, because of the extraordinary character of my revelations, uh, 
Therefore, in order that I should not become conceited, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, an angelos of Satan. That means an angel of Satan. They temper it down with the word messenger, but it's angel of Satan to torment me, colophizo, that I should not become conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord. He means Jesus, I believe. It's obvious about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is fulfilled in weakness. Does that make any sense to anybody? Would Jesus, the real Jesus, leave somebody subject to an angel, the torment and an angel of Satan for whatever good reason? I, there is no good reason to do that. And people say, well, Paul's in, he thinks, Paul reads into this that it's to keep him humble. But he, his Jesus didn't say that, did he? Therefore, I will most gladly boast in my weaknesses in order that the power of Christ may dwell in me. I, I'm glad he tries to put a good, good spin on this, but this is not what I would call uh, an admirable thing that our Lord Jesus left someone subject to an angel of Satan to do, do, do anything. Why didn't he just, just give him instructions? Give him discipleship, just like the Jesus of John 8. In other words, is the Jesus of John 8 the same as the Jesus you're seeing here? I don't think so. The Jesus of John 8 wanted... Uh, would have said, Paul, I want you to love me. I want you to work with me. I'll be, I'll disciple you. Come and listen to me. I'll teach you. But that's not what's happening in here. He's leaving him subject to an angel saying, this is the only quote that would be lost if you said of Jesus by Paul, unless you're just going to assume everything he's saying is from Jesus, even though he never quotes him. And that's not the way it works. You have to quote that person to be his prophet. Okay. Now I want to talk about this apostate theologies. I'm examining just here today. I already, well, I believe dispensationalism is is obviously a, a, a part. It, it, it gets rid of all of Jesus' teachings flat out. Covenant theology is a little bit different, but it's similar. Covenant theology teaches Jesus', Jesus words often belong to a covenant of works. Not like they won't accept some things he says. They're not like the dispensationalists where everything he says is a person who's inferior to Paul. They're there while Jesus sometimes is telling us things that we can value. So I decided to research this uh, carefully. R.C. Sproul has an article in detail, explains the whole principle of covenant theology. And it, it's an article entitled Covenant of Works. And he first describes the covenant of grace, which is basically we, we get the benefits of the flow through of the work of the obedience of Jesus. So we get to use his atonement. N nothing surprising about that, right? Uh, but it's the, the way he un makes it unconditional, meaning he doesn't ever say you have to do and you don't have to repent to get this. You don't have to repent. You don't have to do anything that's in those commands. I, I told you earlier, you know, heaven maimed or hell whole that that's, that's out the window. It's just simply you, you, you become a son or whatever, and you're saved and you don't have to do anything and you don't lose your salvation. But what about the, the believer who had, has to go to heaven maimed or hell whole? That was, that's a risk. <laughs> if you, you can't, you can't rely upon faith alone. Okay, and it's, uh, the atonement is vicarious and substitutionary. That's all fine. It's all fine because that that's the way it was under the law. There, you, it's some other animal is suffering for you, <laughs> and you have to bring this atonement gift. And if you did that, that was part of the last step, but you had to first do your works worthy repentance. And that's what Jesus teaches in Matthew 5, 21, uh, 23 to 24. Anyway, uh, so all of that. Uh, and they call, he calls it Christ's work of active obedience is absolutely central, central to the justification of anyone. It, maybe I, 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 that's an interesting question. Let's just say yes. What, what it doesn't matter. I, you should always pray for Jesus's atonement to apply to you when you sin. Okay, so heaven, main, hell, whole. You can now just say, well, make sure you do also ask uh, God's forgiveness based on pleading the blood of Christ. But you can't just sin and then not repent and plead the blood of Christ because eight times in the Law and Prophets, God called that divination, idolatry. He said that to Samuel, uh, uh, Samuel, to King Saul, when he did this, he, he he disobeyed God's orders, and he now came and he said, "I want to do an atonement." God said, "That's divination. That's idolatry." So this is simply ignorance. You you can't st make a statement like this without m maybe misleading people. I don't know if he means it here, but to to suggest that you're justified by the atonement, even though you haven't done your works worthy repentance, that's not how it works. That's divination and idolatry. Uh, so he says here, if we take away the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us, we take away justification by faith alone. But wait a minute, Mr. Sproul. Jesus said the repentant tax collector is justified. He goes home justified. What, what about that? Did you, did you forget about that? That's not faith alone. What about this, Mr. R.C. Sproul? Mark 9, you, you can't go to heaven without maiming yourself. You have to do your works worthy repentance. Don't you, don't you know what Jesus teaches? 
Well, here's what Jesus teaches in Matthew 5, 22, 23 to 24. If therefore thou art offering thy gift, the word is doron, atoning sacrifice. It's a Hebrew word, doron means uh, atoning sacrifice, but it's a loan word in Greek, so it's in both languages. At the place for sacrifice altar, so there's a term there that is not clearly indicated to you, but it means sacrifice altar. And there rememberest that thy brother has aught against you. Leave there your gift, atoning your, your atoning sacrifice to Daron, before the place of sacrifice altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy atoning sacrifice. So what this is saying is Jesus is, yes, he's teaching uh, you have to have done works worthy repentance to the person you've offended. It could be God. It could be a person. And once you've done that, then you can plead the blood, but not a moment sooner. But if you read all of his article, and I did, it definitely is, he's teaching that, no, 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 <laughs> Jesus' work is all you've done. And you, 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 if you make it anything more than that, you're, you're, you're not saved. But the truth is, if you make it anything less than what Jesus requires, which is what R.C. Sproul is doing, you're apostatizing against his own words here in this passage and in all the passages I've shown you earlier. And that means covenant theology is predicated on apostasy against the words of Jesus. And what did Peter say? If you're, do, if you're guilty of that, and that's exactly what I'm suggesting here, is obviously you're not, you're going to be cut off from God's people on judgment day. You can be deluded now and misled by Mr. Sproul. So I'm trying to help those who are following him and his teaching to follow something that is Christ-centered and Christ-focused because you want to go to heaven and you're not going to get there by relying upon faith alone because even, what, I, I, I know it's James, but it's so blunt, it's so on his face correct that I'm going to, I'm going to sign off with him. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. The only place those words exist that way. Uh, Luther, by the way, mistranslated uh, Romans 3, verse 28 to say faith alone. And he got a lot of heat from that at the time. And he said, you know what? It's because Luther wants to do it. So, but anyway, don't forget to read the preface to Jesus' words on salvation, where you learn this shocking fact that Luther repented, changed his views about Paul even, and then the Lutheran church with, he's dying though. He hands it off to his, his uh, Lieutenant Me Melanchthon and Melanchthon, uh, brings out what's called the majoristic controversy where he gets a guy to write a, a book called On Good Works, Mr. George Major, and George Major basically leads the Lutheran church to reform back to Jesus' actual teachings, of teachings, what I just told you. And this is based on the, the uh, unequivocal fact that the church of the Lutheran church changed in 1555 to 1580, I think it was, <laughs> 1580, yes, 1580, and then in 1580, the Book of Concord is when the solo fetus came back and conquered uh, and eradicated Jesus' message about what I just showed you here today. And that's where the Protestant Reformation went sideways, even though it was recovered for a period of time and, and the Melanchthon had got them to accept double justification, principles of double justification, which Erasmus, Tyndale, uh, Mano Simons, all the lead, other leaders had all agreed on this principle of double justification which is, is basically Jesus' gospel in a nutshell. All right, God bless. Take care, everybody. Ciao. Bye.